much. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. Glad you could join us tonight. I'm here with Councillor Victoria Pelletier. We expect Councillor Roberto Rodriguez to slide into home here in a minute. And um, we have a lot to talk about this week. So thank you for joining us. Um, we have a podcast now, if you're a podcast person. Um, we're on Spotify as Pathways to Progress. Uh, the whole archive of our live shows and our recorded shows is on there. So um, check us out. And uh, so Victoria, Hi. thanks for being here. You yeah. have just really had a couple of weeks, haven't you? Yes. How do um, you feel about being here? I mean, is this okay? It feels, it feels weird. It feels uh, like I haven't had a, an, an in-person thing since the last Monday's council meeting, which was a really challenging meeting. Um, so it feels weird, but I'm glad that I'm here because I, I certainly want to get back to doing the regular things that I was doing prior to Monday's meeting. Um, but yeah, it's been, I, I think, I was thinking about my council tenure and this has probably been the lowest point for mm -hmm. me so far. This has mm -hmm. been the most, the most challenging part of it, definitely. Okay. Um, I know that you were just reading the coverage in the Bangor Daily News just, that just came out about it. It was interesting, I, uh, like last Friday, your supporters, the people who said, I'm out here because I can't stand the way people are treating Victoria and it's horrible and it's not fair and I don't agree with it. Um, you know, a lot of people there today for that point of view, I would say, it seemed to me like about 50, although the Bangor Daily News had the count much higher. The, um, the, the, the people that, uh, you know, are, have been harassing you and using hateful language were not very numerous at all. Very small group yeah. standing in front of the art museum. Um, and uh, I thought the Bangor Daily News made it sound like the two groups were roughly equal, which wasn't true at all. And also that there was some, a lot of exchanges of projectiles. You know, one guy came up with some tomatoes, threw one or two of them from uh, the side with the Black Lives Matter signs and the hate is not welcome here. And the crowd immediately said, dude, you know, that is not okay. We are not yeah. gonna let you do that. Yeah, yeah I think um, the, the part, I mean, this whole thing really, for me personally, is, um, you know, I'm I'm glad that people are speaking out about the what's been happening with the banners and with, and this isn't the first time. Like this has been happening for a really long time, uh, and I think the thing for me personally is that I don't want people to make it about me. Like I want in individuals because when I see that sign, I had to walk past it every single day. Mm -hmm. But so did the kids at King Middle School. So did the kids at Reiki. So did the kids who go to Portland High School. And so do older adults that are existing in Portland and are black. And so like when I walk past something that says that it's okay to be white, it has never not been okay to be white. And I think that that's for the sure. biggest thing that I want to that I want to put forward is it's never not been okay to be white. So we don't actually need a huge banner saying it's okay to be white, especially on the first day of Black History Month. Um, and it's it was really hurtful and it was really offensive and it was really insulting. And I spoke up about it because I felt like I couldn't ignore it any longer. And I know people have been saying like, ignore, ignore things like that. And uh -huh. like, just, you know, like don't bring any attention to it, but it's, it's it's hard for somebody like me and somebody, you know, so many other black people we have that live in Portland that have to walk past that every single day. And I think that it's incredibly insulting and incredibly unfair to people who deserve to, to live in, and work in Portland and not have to walk past a sign that says it's okay to be white as a non-white person. It's uh, often referred to as a dog whistle, yeah. those type of, because, you know, people will say, well, isn't it okay to be white? The dog whistle part being uh, the reference to the fact that it hasn't been okay and still isn't okay in many places to be uh, not in a white appearing body and be safe. Right. Like you can't be safe unless you appear white. And that, as you point out, that affects old people, it affects children. And someone like you who is uh, an elected official, um, strong in your community, a lot of support, uh, you're one of the people that uh, is are acting on behalf of the more vulnerable, vulnerable who either can't speak up or w are afraid to speak up. But you drew a lot of really hateful uh, communications yeah. by speaking up. Yeah, that was that's the part where I keep thinking about 
you know, because naturally you you do something and then there is going to be a reaction, which I was I was prepared for. Not not as much as that. I think as much as I received. Um, so I was going back and forth, like, oh my gosh, should I have, should I, I should I not have said anything? And like I was playing it out in my head. But in any scenario, whether I was a city councilor or whether I was an, an activist with no elected official title, I would have spoken out about that because that's just who I am. That's always been my character is to speak out on these issues, especially when so few people are. Because again, I think it's important to say this is Portland. This is a city that. Um, tries really hard to be inclusive and tries really hard to be progressive and celebrate all different identities. And three years ago, we were, you know, doing eight hour protests for Black Lives Matter. People were laying on the ground for eight minutes at a time trying to say, I am here and showing up for black lives. And it felt really, um, it just felt really disappointing and like heartbreaking to see like that sign is now up and we're just, I, I'm just, I just have to walk past it and like say nothing. And I, I, I hate that for myself and I hate that for so many others who have been silenced for being black and who have been silenced for speaking out for being black. And I'm very aware that, you know, people have been like harmed for less than what I've done. Like I spoke up, I have a platform and I spoke up and the, the feedback was really significant and the death threats, which were on this like anonymous 4chan page or whatever, that's where the threats came from. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it, it's just a really surreal experience reading an entire thread about how awful of a person you are and all the things that should happen to you because you spoke out. And, you know, I sent all of that information to the city manager. And so like, it's, it's out there now. Um, and I was posting about it on my council page as well of saying like, here's the feedback, here's what I'm getting. But yeah, it's, it's been the, it's been by far the, the worst month that I've had. Um, it's a typical intimidation uh, tactic toward yeah. people of color and women of color in particular to threaten you know, sexual violence, violent, violent death, that kind yeah. of thing. So in one, on the one hand, you've got a platform now where you would have said something anyway, but yeah. now when you say something, it's, it, it has such broader reach because right. you've, you, know, you have that platform. But on the other hand, because of the platform, um, you know, I've seen this many times in other, uh, you know, anti-racist movements. It's just really a horrible thing to live through. It's hard to feel safe. It's hard to feel okay about going to work. And Roberto, thanks for joining us. So good to see you. Yeah, I'm okay. How are you? We are, this is like, this is great. We were like, you're gonna walk in mid. That's right. Thing, and it's I live love TV. Because it. it's, it's more, I think it's just it's very, very real. Now so. they know it's live TV. Is this thing on? Uh, yeah, yeah, it probably is. Oh, yeah, you're going to hold the thing now, and then, then I think, um, there we go. Perfect. So we're just checking in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Victoria has quite a check in, as uh, you're aware. Yeah. How are you doing? What's going on with you? I'm good. I'm reminding myself that I'm neither built for running nor in shape for running, <laughs> and I ran Did here. You here? <laughs> in the snow? No, well, I parked a couple of blocks away. I'm like, I gotta make it. I, gotta. <laughs> I hustled my way here. Thank you. Here, we'll do a count. I guess I should have reminded you earlier today, so that was my bad. I should be more on, on top of this. Day. Yeah, no. I, I, I was like, oh, yeah, I kept remembering. Like, I have this thing at, at six that I have to remember to go to. Oh, but good. it's been a weird month, so, oh, yeah. yeah. This is, I feel like this is really shaky and today. We, and, yeah, we, <laughs> all right, we're we set. checked out all the chairs. So <laughs> all right, one. good. All right, I feel like this is not a prank. It's on. <laughs> we're here. Okay. I'm so sorry. You were saying something really serious, and I walked in no, here joking. No, no, honestly, so it's okay. I needed to, to break up a little bit. No, I, I think I, I was just talking about this has been the worst month I've ever had um, on the council, and it, it, it's definitely a thing of like back and forth, like should I have said anything or should I have not said anything? But I was saying that I couldn't imagine an avenue where I wouldn't have, like just because that's how I'm built. It has nothing to do with being on the council or not. Um, I just know that I would have and the same, the same things would have resulted. Cause you know, I think when you do something and you get a lot of feedback, it's, it's a lot of like, should I have even said anything? Like maybe it would have been better if I didn't say it. But I, one, like again, that's not how I operate and two, I think in my history, there have been people that have spoken out on really scary, harmful, racist things. Yeah. And because they did that, I am now awarded these seats that I wouldn't have had before. I'm awarded the privilege of being on city council. I'm awarded the privilege of being able to vote. I'm awarded the privilege of being able to walk into the same store as a white person. 
all of those things resulted because somebody spoke up and said like, I'm gonna say something and it might result in me getting harmed, but I'm gonna speak the truth and be unapologetic in that. And so that's really how I have to align my existence here. And while it's not exactly the same because we are in a society where on paper, black people and white people are equal, um, it's still a terrifying thing to do, but I always think about who's coming after me and who's next. Do I want the kids at King and Reiki and Portland High School and Deering to have to walk past that that banner every single day as black people? Absolutely not. So if there is something that I can do to speak on that issue and to speak on my experience with it, I feel it is within me to, to have to do that. I don't really see another avenue. Well, we're so much more comfortable with people that did that back a long time ago, right? We just like lionized the Rosa Parks or whoever that said, you know, took the stand. And uh, But it makes people very uncomfortable when someone actually does it like right here and yeah. now yeah. because it's a big reminder that like, well, things are still very unequal mm -hmm. and there's still a lot of, uh, you know, uh, danger and vulnerability in yeah. standing up for just your basic human rights. If, if as a person of color, as a young woman of color, especially very vulnerable place to be. So can I, can I say something about that though? Because yes, what you said is true, but there is, and we have acknowledged over the last, I mean, we've been getting warned about this for the last 20 years and we've seen it manifest in the last eight years. There has been a resurgence of like really far right conservative groups that have started to gain more momentum. And um, so it's not just something from the past, it's something that's getting augmented in, our, in the reality today. So um, I, I think again, the fallacy in how we call this out and it's part of what I commented on, I'm still winded, <laughs> that evening, is, you know, that's not our past. And neither is a comment of, that doesn't reflect us necessary. Quite the opposite. It's time to say, yo, this is the reality in which we live in. This is the reality that a black woman in the city of Portland in 2023 is experiencing. Like, we really gotta be careful with the whole exceptionalist, you know, perception that that's not how it should be, that's not how it is anymore, or that's how it used to be. It 100% is what is going on. I mean, these folks were out here in front of City Hall this morning having a it's all right or it's okay to be white uh, rally. I mean, it's, what ha it's what's happening. It ain't the past creeping up on us. It's today just reminding us that it's still here. Yeah. Yep. And the kids that are <laughs> coming up through school know it. They totally know it. Mm -hmm. They don't More think so they don't think racism is over, or that no. they you know yeah. can speak up and feel safe about speaking up. Yeah. If mm -hmm. they have a classroom or they have a school where they can, then that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. But just to come out on the streets and encounter uh, you know that kind of mm -hmm. racist dog whistling, for lack of a better word, that you know that's a scary thing. Yeah. But as economic conditions deteriorate, I'm sure that, you know, again, history will suggest that people start looking for scapegoats. They start looking for reasons like, oh, we're, you know, it, like if a rising tide lifts all boats, a sinking tide drops mm -hmm. all boats, mm -hmm. and everybody's dealing with uh, difficulty paying their bills and staying warm, and it, uh, it's not a, not a good situation that we're in, I think as white people get more frantic and uh, you know, desperate about hanging on to their privilege, they become more and more loud about, there is no such thing as white privilege. I, have, I yeah. cannot tell you how many low-income white people have tried to argue with me that there is no such thing as white privilege. I, I always say to them, well, when your kid was a teenager, did they ever do stupid stuff that like, brought them into contact with the police? And of course, everyone goes, yeah. Go, were you afraid they would die as a result of that contact? Then you have white privilege. Then that right there alone is. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's hard with with like the specifics of how like whiteness has manifested itself in 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 these like kind of covert ads of saying like it's okay to be white and like the response I got a lot was you're racist against white people if you're calling that out. Um, and I've said it to exhaustion that like it has never not been okay to be a white person, especially in a place like Portland. And it's 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 it makes it hard to to feel like we're we can have a, a collective dialogue about it when it's just like, well, you're a racist. If you don't like that sign, then you must be racist against white people. 
because if you did like that sign, then you would say it's okay to be white. And like my whole thing is like, when has it ever not been okay? I'm trying to figure out, like, has it's it ever not been okay? This is a, is a system of oppression yeah. that favors <laughs> some people, the skin is a certain color over others. So it is impossible for the people that are disfavored under that system to be racist. Might they be prejudiced? They might, uh, but that is not Racism. Racism is systematic inequality that's like baked in and, you know, based on something as trivial as your skin yeah. color. It's and I think we're all aware that black people in this country have never had the opportunity to, to account or to, you know, get together enough power to be oppressive towards anybody. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I think that, you know, I, we talked a little bit in that evening about, you know, economic growth and, and financial freedom, right? Like, and coincidentally, that same week we had this Monopoly game, Portland Edition, come out. And I think, you know, Monopoly, this uh, this uh, gentleman, Dr. Claude Anderson, he uses this example quite often when he talks about, you know, economics in the, in the black community. He says, you know, but picture, you know, the game, in the, the game in the Monopoly as the history of this country, where we're all sitting out getting ready to play. You're a white person, you get a full bank, and you get to start the game ahead of time, and you get to roll. And then I show up halfway through the game, I get half the bank and I get to roll. Victoria, as a black woman, shows up, you don't get damn and you get to roll. When, wherever you land, rent's gonna be due or you're gonna end up in jail. So you're either gonna go in debt or you're gonna end up in jail. I might have a little bit of a chance because I'm a little bit lighter in my skin. I have a little bit more privilege. You got the whole bank. You get to tell us how we're gonna end up. My dad got his GI <laughs> Bill after he went in the army. <laughs> Did, yeah. did black people get their GI Bill after right. they went, yeah. you know, they went and did the same thing? Yeah. Never got they 40 acres and a mule either. Right. Federal so, support for mortgage yeah. help, federal support for their college education. Like, people don't realize this yeah. stuff. So the whole, this whole thing of, you know, black people being able to, to be racist or to oppress other people, that's just a fallacy. And we, that's, that needs to stop right away. Um, and again, you know, even the whole idea of like we need more black people in government or we need black police officers or black, no. What we need is our communities to be able to get economically advantageous positions where we're reinvesting money in our own economy. You know, every black dollar eventually ends up in the white economy. Every Puerto Rican dollar eventually ends up in the white economy. Why can't that money be circulated amongst ourselves? Why can I have my dollar bounce back and forth between black and brown people? Why does it always have to go back to the white economy? Because that reestablishes that place of support and power that allows them to be oppressive towards others. But if we create economic growth and financial opportunities for our communities and we create our communities like to really live within communities and advance each other, then we'll be able to make these political positions more advantageous because we'll have money to put the candidates into the offices that we need them to. But right now what we're doing out here is suffering. We're out here suffering because we are, we're in a position to be advantageous, but our communities don't have the economic power that, that they need to drive themselves forward in, the, in this country. And you're drawing a lot of hostility. And I mean, it's obviously a, an attempt to intimidate and silence mm -hmm. people by being so nasty and so threatening that, yeah. you know, somebody uh, less brave than you might go, whoa, I just cannot. I cannot get through my day and do my job and deal with these uh, violent threats popping I mean, yeah. up on my phone That's every time I, I go to. Yeah, uh, like I, I just took a full, I'm still taking a break because I wasn't feeling like safe. I wasn't, yeah. you know, you're looking at this online anonymous messaging board and wondering how far is it gonna get when people are saying these really awful things. And it just, I mean, I'm, I'm still like processing and I'm not really sure like where I'm gonna go. I loved being able to use my council page to connect with people. I was really proud of the page that I've built. Um, but that page now makes me so visible. Every single thing that I put now is being screen grabbed and like dissected and then I'm getting, like I, it's this just like cause and effect of like me posting and then somebody takes it and then I get a bunch of messages and DMs that I don't wanna read. So. I feel like I'm still trying to figure out where I'm going. I'm, I'm, I just, I haven't, like, I haven't fully processed it because it's just as bad as it's ever gotten that I don't really know, like, trauma-wise, how to move forward. Because, um, like, this is the first time I've talked about it since, like, Monday's meeting. About so, it with us. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I haven't, no, I haven't really easy. talked about it. So, so yeah, I mean, but I will say to change gears a little bit, the the support from Portland has been overwhelming, like just beyond anything that I could have 
been prepared for and I've gotten really great messages from the kings, the kids at, from the Deering Black Student Union. I got a great care package of these amazing messages from the kids at King Middle School who I visit with a lot and you know educators and people in my district reaching out and saying you know we appreciate you speaking out and like thank you for that and we're sorry to hear what's been happening. So the, the, the support has been really great and beyond what I was even prepared for at the meeting. Mm -hmm. On Monday we had a lot of public comment of people coming in and sharing and that felt really good. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I need to remember that that part is a lot more impactful than the, the negative part of it. But you know that's that's like that's really hard because the negative comments get in and, and so they're, they're meant you know, to scare. They're, they're meant they're, to scare. Yeah, you know, and it's not just you know. like someone criticizing your point of view and saying no. I don't agree with you or whatever. It's threatening. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's what makes it hard. Is it so much? It's beyond like how we vote on stuff. Yeah. Like we get that all the time. Of course, people disagree with our votes. That's like part of this role. Mm -hmm. But I think the me feeling unsafe going on a walk in Portland because I'm worried like is this message board which is anonymous gonna come to life and manifest into the point where I don't want to die over in this job of being a Portland City Councilor so nor should you you know no. yeah but it's like we have elected officials that are like consistently like under attack and in, in different parts of, of the country we see it happening obviously at the national level too of you know like somebody going after like Nancy Pelosi's husband who Yo. broke in with a hammer. Like just it's it's just getting so uh, scary and violent, and it it definitely makes you think like where is the line and how how much of an impact am I going to make versus taking care of my own personal safety yep. and personal health. So you have to take care of yourself because if you right. don't take care of yourself, you can't do yeah. any jobs or city council. Yeah, yeah, or be a parent or. I, right. That was a big lesson for me in you know, teaching and being a parent. Like, you've got to do the self-care because yeah. then you can't help anybody if you yep. don't. Well, should we switch gears? Do you, have, do you have more that you'd like to say on this? Or I had a funny, I have some comic relief for you. I'm so I was standing out there with you know, a supporter today and, and saying, hey, do you have any questions for the counselors tonight? And, and she said, yeah, I want to know why they voted unanimously to allow a developer to build a huge uh, housing complex from City Hall down to Franklin uh, Arterial, with, and, they've, and the developers already paid the fine so they don't have to put any affordable housing in. And I said, the entire city council <laughs> voted for that? And she said, yes. Why are you guys laughing? Us. That's not very funny. Yeah. Did, not did you us. did you no, vote for that? Not, <laughs> not wasn't us. you. That was not us. The, no. That's the planning board. Yeah. Common planning misconception board. that people yeah. think that we're the same. <laughs> but um, that's that's happened a couple times actually. I will say since I've been on the council, I've experienced just like I see stuff that's like unanimous vote by the council and I'm like, wait, did we? And I'm like, did I miss a meeting? Yeah, I'm like, like, oh my God, did I? <laughs> but it's just like a big deal. How yeah. do I not know about it? <laughs> and then it's, like, it's, it's most often the planning board and I think with those types of, because I, I recently saw that too about the, the hotel that's now been approved. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, that's the planning board. And I'm, I'm curious to see if, what level of public comment happened at that meeting because I think that happens often where things are voted on at the planning board level and people find out later because yeah. they're just I'm not sure if they're you know it's sometimes it's tough to find and like our agenda center what's happening there's just a lot going on it's hard for people to make meetings but I encourage everybody to go to the planning board meetings and get be in the know with what they're talking about and what they're voting on because that sometimes I read things and there's one or two people that make a comment and that's it um, and it's the same with us. It's like that type of public response. We need that in order to really make sure that we are being accountable with what we're voting on and the jobs that we were elected to do. But if we get two comments, it makes it really hard. So, so yeah, but to answer your question, that was not us. Yeah. <laughs> that was the planning board. <laughs> it was the planning board. And, and to Tori's point, um, you know, like every, every, every step or every phase that a, a developer has to go through, you know, there's always opportunities for public comment. Um, but the process itself is, number one, is there, is, there's multiple stages, it is complicated, even a year into the council, there's still stuff that, you know, we're learning about what the planning boards, um, you know, what their role is and what the, the council's role is. Um, and certainly the difference between like a, a zone map, map amendment versus like a site plan and all the different things that should be taken care of under each step. So, you know, there's certainly a lot of like education that needs to happen. There's a lot more uh, public engagement that needs to happen. When you said that there's usually like 
two people at each of those meetings, it's usually the same two people, yes. right? Like we have, and like that's, that, yeah. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but there are some folks who are just always there and you hear the same voices. And some of them are immensely valuable, right? Like there's some of these folks that they do so much work and they provide so much insight into what we're doing that I'm like, we should be paying them. Yeah. Um, but, but again, you know, you're hearing from a really small group of folks. Um, I, I, I also, I think a, I, just very slightly differently from, from what Tori said, um, I think that people, it's impossible to really ask people to be in all those meetings, so it kind of falls yeah. on us. And we've yeah. been, we've taken some really difficult votes that are opposite of what the planning board has suggested yeah. for that same reason, because we know that there's people that we're hearing from that weren't at those meetings that hold really strong opinions about a, another luxury hotel in downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to bring those voices in, and we do uh, when we vote, and in lieu of there being like a whole community showing up, yeah. that, that's kind of what we do. So if they don't show up, they let us know. That's, that's, a, yeah, that's a good point, because I, rem I remember it was was it like a year ago that, that we had the <laughs> the uh, 58 Fourth Street vote, and that that was a um, unanimous planning board vote that was not unanimous on the council, actually failed in the council, mm -hmm. um, and that was that was a tough one because mm -hmm. I don't think that happens very often where the council and the planning board are not in alignment mm -hmm. um, because naturally the planning board does all of that work and is essentially like here you go, this is our recommendation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, I think that's a great point was that we were, we were hearing from constituents who weren't at the planning board part of it. And so that makes it really hard as well because then we're like, well, we have, we're accountable to the constituents. And, but then the planning board's kind of like, we, that wasn't a unanimous thing and you just kind of like, I don't want to say like killed our work, but kind of, you know, like back to the drawing board a little bit. And that makes it challenging in terms of just trying to make sure that we're being representative of who elected us, well, but also listening to the planning board. It might irritate the planning board, but I know my friend who posed the question is going to be really thrilled to find yes. out, like, oh, that yes. was just the planning board. Not us. Okay, we didn't do yet. that. Okay. <laughs> I have a more, I, I was asked a more serious question while I was out and on the pavement today um, by someone who uh, is very active supporting the homeless community. And uh, their question was, warming center seem to be very hastily last yes. minute yep. why is that why was that particular um, timing so rushed and and just in general it's maine it's winter mm -hmm. why aren't we having warming centers mm -hmm. that are just can be counted on and it's not a scramble to provide them so i'm, I'm bringing that question to you as well yeah. um, i know you were a little salty on your on your um, <laughs> counselor page about, okay, we can finally tell you about the warming center. So reading between yeah. the lines, it seemed like you were also Well, I did, I did post a story about it because I, I want to always be just like really transparent about like how it's going for us because I think sometimes people think because we're counselors, we get like the secret information before the public and when it's confidential stuff that happens. But with the warming center, like we were being told the same thing as the public, which is like, we're, we're working on it and we hope to have an announcement this afternoon. But it's not like the council was made aware of the warming center at 10 and the public was at three. Mm -hmm. Like we hadn't, I didn't know until the press release came out. And I will say the good news is in health and human services and public safety, we have prioritized for one of our goals for to really dive into at next month's meeting, what's the plan around the warming, cent warming uh, centers and how can we put a plan in place so that depending on uh, the degree that it is or whatever, um, we have something ready to go for next time because that was a that was an all day scramble. People were terrified. It should not ever be like that where we were kind of putting stuff together as, you know, what is that saying? The plane's like crashing yeah. and we're like putting them together. Building the um, plane while flying Building it. the plane while, while flying it. So we do have, we are gonna work on that in HHS because we did notice that that was a huge need. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lack of room, it's a lack of staffing. I think that was the hardest part too, was trying to find people to operate the warming center for a two day span, which made it really difficult because we're already really short staffed at the city level. And it's again, I think it, it ties in a little bit to just like our huge crisis with like housing and asylum seekers and all of this lack of just space um, and room and shelter. And so that manifested itself in the warming center issue. But I am glad that we're gonna 
Well, I'm happy to hear that the committee is yes. you know, taking, taking that over yeah. and realizing the yeah. timing. Believe it or not, our time is almost up. Wow. It's a fast, oh, it's really fast, fast half hour for I you. <laughs> um, I don't want to end without thanking our great director, Warren Edgar, here at Portland Media Center. We could not do the show without you. Uh, tonight, we're helped in tech by Shailen O'Brien. So thank you for that. We are a podcast now. That was, oh, that's right. that was your brainchild yeah. saying, you know, we'd get more audience if we were a podcast. And we're on Spotify. The whole archive is there. There. So um, that's yes. been positive growth for us. And, um, you know, thanks for being with us tonight. We couldn't do it without you, the audience. And thanks for caring enough about your city government to tune in and uh, hear from uh, Roberto Rodriguez and Victoria Pelletier, our progressive city councilors. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you.